Okay. Uh, what we're going to be talking about uh, today is a uh, is a network uh, or nano vector network analyzer. And at least at some point during this talk, I will say network vector analyzer instead of vector network analyzer. I I get dyslexic with it. Uh, some of the uses of a, of a vector network analyzer are to assess the SWR, that's a, that's a common use. You can also use it to measure the impedance of, of uh, cables and antennas. You can get information about when things aren't matching well when you're getting a bad SWR, whether or not the, the issue is that you've got too much inductance or too much capacitance in the, in the components. Uh, and then it also, although we're not going to talk about it today, actually allows you to do things like check on the frequency response of filters or different components. So there's a, a lot more than you can do that I can, that I can sort of talk about right now. But uh, let's, uh, uh, there's a number of displays that it does. We're going to focus on the one for SWR and also on a Smith chart. And for those of you who haven't seen a Smith chart recently, <laughs> I'll give you just a little rundown on, on, on what one is and, and why it's so useful despite looking so confusing. The, um, and it's also uh, can, can do lots of other, other plots. Uh, so one of the things it does is it can give you a plot of SWR. And generally speaking, what you want to have, of course, are low values of SWR. It basically is, is saying that, uh, that you, you aren't getting uh, sort of a lot of highs and lows in the line. You're getting a consistent, consistent throughput. Uh, and it's something that changes with the frequency. It's, got, it's a, a function of how much inductance and how much uh, uh, capacitance you have. And so as you go from a low frequency to a high frequency, you will see that the SWR value changes. And it changes sometimes by a lot. And you'll see in one case, it changes by a whole lot over a very short, uh, short interval there. So low values are good. You'd like to have 1.1. Uh, Most tuners built into rigs can handle up to about three. If you've got a good antenna tuner, it can maybe handle, handle nine or more, but uh, that's uh, uh, sort of the, the limits on that. Now on to the Smith chart. Okay, that's the, the basic part of a Smith chart potentially looks really, really confusing because it's actually plotting a number of different things all together. But it's, it's not that crazy hard to understand if you remember a couple, couple things about it. First of all, the center is good, and I'll show you why that's the, the case. Um, let's, uh, first of all, it's split into two parts. The top part of it, the Smith chart is a place where you've got a component that's inductive. The lower part is where you have something that's capacitive. And then you've got the line here that basically shows where there, there is no reactance. Reactance is, is, uh, uh, is what you get when you have the, the either capacitance or, or inductance. And that's sort of the ideal. You'd like to be sort of somewhere on that line when you're hooked up to an antenna. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about the curvy things here, the circles. Uh, what those are is they represent what the impedance is. Now, all of our antennas and, and cables for ham radio typically like to see 50 ohms. Okay, and that's the circle here. That's the 50 ohm circle. Sorry that it isn't very circular there, but that's that's sort of it. Now, if you had something that was absolutely shorted, it would show up out here at the at the left hand side. If you had something that was completely open, where there's no connection at all, it's just just not there, then you're going to be uh, at this at this other end of the edge of the end of the circle there. But where would we like to be if we're talking about 
uh, ham radio antenna. If I hook it up, where do you where do you want to be? And the answer is that you want to be at that sweet spot. You want to be at the place where you have uh, have low reactance, where you've got that horizontal line that uh, that uh, is uh, is no essentially no reactance, and you'd like to be at 50 ohms. Okay, where you're so that you're uh, uh, you've got uh, got 50 ohms of uh, of uh, of radiation resistance there. So, if you look at a Smith chart and and there's nothing near that central spot, you know that antenna is not not doing very well. And by looking at whether or not it's inductive or capacitive, you can see what sorts of changes might be made with an antenna tuner in order to make it uh, make it work better. Um, yeah, so here is uh, uh, one of the things about a Smith chart is that just as for SWR, it's a function of frequency. So what we've got here is something of where it starts at a low frequency and then goes to higher and higher and higher frequencies until it finally gets to the highest frequency that we've specified. And it's pretty common to see things that sort of do this this loop de loop pattern. Some sometimes it'll go around and around and around and around if you're looking at a fairly broad frequency range there. Um, and so uh, your antenna is going to work well on some frequencies and not others, and this is going to give you an idea as, as to which frequencies that those are. Now, how do you get a Smith chart plot? <laughs> And the answer is that you use your vector network analyzer. It's going to actually generate radio frequency signals over a certain range. And then it's going to measure the how strong the returning signal is and how the phase has been changed. Um, and those readings can be converted into SWR and resistance and reactance and all of the other things. And what's nice about it is that it doesn't just scan one frequency, it scans a whole range of range of frequencies. Um, the, uh, this is a, a picture of, of my network vector analyzer. I've got it, got it here, but I, I sort of doubt on Zoom with the, with the backgrounds, it's going to show up very well. It's a, you can see it's a small little thing. Uh, they're pretty inexpensive. You can get them anywhere between about 55 bucks. It, the ones that tend to be more expensive tend to have things like uh, like better connectors. This one's got you know tiny little SMA connectors that are going to require some adapters. They actually have some of them that will have N connectors or or uh, or PL259 or SO239 connectors. Uh, one of the things about the cheaper kits is they don't always come. With these little uh, with these little uh, uh, calibration terminators that are these little things over on the side, and we'll talk about calibration in a moment. Uh, some of the cheaper kits won't have that, and you're going to want to have it. So so look carefully if you decide to to purchase there. It can be controlled either using a little, uh, well, let's see, a little switch on the top of it that's basically sort of a toggle that goes back and forth that you can click on, or there's a touch screen. My particular one actually came with a little guitar pick to act as sort of a, uh, uh, to make it so that you could click accurately on the screen and and uh, to do that. It's, a, it's small enough that doing your ham-handed fingers probably isn't going to going to be a good solution. Um, this is what, uh, so this is sort of what it looks like in my hand. Now, one of the things you probably picked up is when you first turn the thing on, <laughs> good luck making any sense of that. <laughs> it's, uh, it basically shows you everything it wants. It shows you the Smith chart, it shows you the SWR chart, it's showing you the log magnitude and the phase chart, all on top of each other. Uh, it is interpretable sort of, uh, in part because it includes information up at the top that's actually printed. Now, one of the, the things you'll notice is we have these little markers that are labeled one, and that represents where a particular frequency is on, on all of those charts. So if I uh, move the frequency up or down, in this case, I'm at, at, at uh, 24.5 megahertz. This is where 
that's found on, on each of the charts. The, at the bottom of the graph is, the, is what they call their stimulus frequency. So this is a scan that goes from 14 megahertz up to 30 megahertz. And so 24 is sort of three quarters of the way of the way up there. Now what it does is, okay, we've got marker one at 2456. Well, at 2156, our SWR is one to 1.54. And based on our Smith chart, it's saying that our impedance is 33.3 is ohms. That's a little low, we'd like it to be 50. And we have a certain, it's slightly capacitive. And as you can see in the Smith chart, well, you could sort of see it's a little bit below that middle line. So that would be into the capacitive part of it. And then they've got some other things over here about the log magnitude and the phase that I'm, I'm not going to mess with. But one of the first things you want to learn when you use this is how to turn off most of this. <laughs> Uh, the way you do that is there's a, in the display menu, there's an option to turn on and off certain of the traces. So what you can do is go in and turn off some of these so that if I turn on only trace zero, now it's just giving me an SWR plot. I'm not seeing my Smith chart anymore. I've got none of the phase stuff and things like that. It lets me focus on the thing that I'm, I may be most interested in. Uh, and then, and it's giving me the same information that it gave on that, that really crowded, ugly chart. If I go down and select one of the other traces instead, I can get just my Smith chart. And we can see that point there is a little bit below that line down in the capacitive area. And it's a little bit closer to a short than it is to, a, uh, to an open circuit. And so, that's our 33 ohms, where we'd like to be right there at 50 ohms, but we're we're a little bit a uh, little bit low there. And we can actually read that out there that it's saying at 33.3 ohms is 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 where we are at, at point one. Now, the menu system has got a ton of options. You don't really need to use all of them. That's the good news. And I shown you some that I tend to use a lot, but some of them I'm going to use more than others. Uh, in terms of deciding what to display on the screen, you can do that using the display menu that then takes you to the trace and that lets you pick which traces like we just did. Or we can go to the format menu and say, okay, I'd like a Smith chart, I'd like an SWR chart, et cetera. They, they, those two, overlap a, a lot in terms of what they do. There's also the option to, if you like a set of settings that you have, you can go and you can you can save those and, and later on recall them. And we'll talk in de a little more detail about this start uh, uh, menu there and also this calibrate menu and, and how that works. So let's, so let's go and do a little bit of that. If I want to go and use the, the network analyzer, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first of all select the stimulus frequency range. So I need to say before I said I wanted to go from 14 megahertz to 30 megahertz. Well, this thing will go up to this particular one goes up to 1.5 gigahertz from you know one megahertz or, or less. <laughs> it's a, it's got an extremely broad range. So you're going to want to pick the frequencies that are of interest to you. So if you're interested in 80 meters, you're going to want to look at the frequency range of 80 meters. Uh, the next step is to calibrate the vector network analyzer. And then usually you want to save that information to a memory location so that you can call it up later so you don't have to go through the, the whole select stimulus frequencies and calibrate each time. You can just say, I want settings number three and boom, you're, you're, you're reset up again. Uh, and, then, uh, and then you can also set the display uh, parameters. Now, you need to do steps one and two in order because when you go and select the stimulus frequencies, the appropriate calibration may change. You don't want to calibrate and then set your frequencies because you're going to throw everything off anyway. 
So let's look at how, how we do that. If we go into the, uh, the, the stimulus menu, what we've got is a button for st our start frequency and for our stop frequency. There are some other buttons here. You don't really need to, to, to use them. I, I really just do start and stop. And there's a keypad here that I can move around to, to type in the frequency that I would like. And then I can either, either hit M for gigahertz or, or excuse me, G for gigahertz, M for megahertz, or K for kilohertz. Um, and I can use decimals and so forth. So I would just type in the, the, the frequency that I would like to start. And then I repeat the process for putting in the frequency that I'd like to stop. And then that's what's going to show up on the bottom of the, the screen there. For calibration, I'm going to use my, uh, my three little calibration uh, uh, terminators here. And these are open. And notice that there's no pin in this one. There's no connection between the outside and the, and the inside. And you may say, well, heck, why don't I just leave just leave it off. That's open. <laughs> well, the answer is, especially if you're working with microwaves and things like that, it, and one that's, that's not connected but has something there is different than one that just has nothing there. For a lot of the lower frequencies, it really doesn't matter very much. You could just take, you know, just have, leave your piece of coax with nothing on it, and that would probably be OK. Uh, there's also one that's shorted. And notice here that the, the center pin is connected to the ground. So you're just, just shorting the ground there. And then finally, you have a load. And this is basically a, a, a 50 ohm dummy load. It's a really, really tiny one because this thing's got no power to, to output there. You're putting out minimal, minimal power there. And so. Um, and those are our SMA connectors that just screw directly into the little SMA plugs uh, on the end of the on the end of the uh, unit. Incidentally, there are two plugs on the end of the unit, but you really only use the top one for doing antenna testing. The other one is is for if you're going to take and be looking at filters and things like that, where you're taking the output from the top one and feeding it into the bottom one. Uh, the, um, so anyway, what we do is we go through uh, 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 steps to, to do that. Now, one of the things is that I tend to use uh, BNC connectors to connect up most of my antennas because I can do it sort of quickly to disconnect them when there's lightning or if I'm moving them to different locations. Now, what that means is that if I've done my calibration just using the uh, the standard connectors, it's calibrated to here. And I'm actually testing everything out here, which actually includes two parts, the barrel connector and the uh, BNC connector, that actually aren't going to be part of my antenna. My antenna and cable really starts here. So what I did, just to, just to see if it made any difference, is I actually made myself a set of those terminators that are BNCs. So here's an open one. There's no center pin installed in this one. There's a, a, a shorted one where I've shorted the center pin out. And then this is an old dummy load left over from the days when we used to actually do ethernets using 50 ohm cable, <laughs> a little uh, 50 ohm uh, a dummy load adapter. If you were really doing super precise work, you would be purchasing a much more, you can literally spend thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars on these terminators to, to for calibration of, of, uh, of uh, you know, higher end equipment. Anyway, I, I, the, probably the ones that come with the kit are, are just fine. So I wouldn't, wouldn't get too excited about, but the idea being that now, since where I was hooking on those adapters, now the device under test is only my antenna and the cable. Like I say, this is, this is probably something you don't need to do, but I, I did it, so I'm showing it off. Um, now, the calibration process is you go into the calibration menu and then you put the open connector on the end and you click on open. And then you put the shorted connector on the end and you hit short. And then you put the other, the, the uh, dummy load connector on and you hit load. 
And notice that, that it's actually doing a display as you do it, because I said that this end of the Smith chart would be short, and there it is. There's, there's the short showing up. So if you're ever uncertain as to whether or not your calibrations are, are current, you can always just take and stick these on and look to see whether or not the short shows up where it should show up and the uh, the open one shows up at the other end of the Smith chart where it should, and the load showing up right in the middle, the dummy loads right in the middle where 50 ohms, our sweet spot where we want it to want it to be. And Ed, I will point out there that that, that uh, the, note that this dummy load is is perfectly balanced and non-inductive, and it would be a lousy antenna. <laughs> The reason being that it's entirely resistance, but hopefully your your real antenna isn't just a resistor. <laughs> um, so the other thing also is you don't have to depend on this crappy little display. I mean, it's a nice display to have in the field. It's, it's usable, but there's also PC software that will allow you. Uh, actually, I won't say PC. It runs under Linux. It runs under Mac software that allows you to use the, the USB port in the, in the unit to connect up to a, a PC and get sort of a displays sort of simultaneously. And uh, in this case here, what I do is go and do screenshots off my screen in order to do it. The only downside is my screen is a crabby little screen and it cuts off at the bottom what the frequencies are. <laughs> so uh, uh, the, that's uh, so just imagine when you're looking at these that down on the bottom is a nice clear display that says what the what the frequencies are. Now, um, let's uh, let's look at this sort of in an in an actual example taken from this last weekend. The Aries Group went out and did a a setup of uh, of uh, uh, NVIS antennas uh, uh, that. Uh, and uh, uh, Greg set up a, a 40 meter dipole uh, as seen here. Uh, K4D and D set up an 80 meter dipole. Uh, Joe KO8V, he's got one back here, and it's one that actually has a has a tuner at the bottom of the at the bottom of the antenna to to actually tweak it uh, on the fly. And then we have Warren. He has sort of an unusual one because it's got one an 80 meter dipole that runs one direction, then it's got a 40 meter dipole that runs at right angles to it. So we went out and we hooked up the network vector analyzer to it. Now, I've scrambled the order in which I'm going to show you the examples. They will not be shown in this order. So I want you to be thinking about which antenna is actually going to match up with which, which display. So. Here's a, here's a one, and I've I've trimmed off those two displays over to the side that don't that we haven't sort of talked about and aren't going to talk about, and we basically were doing a scan from about the uh, uh, 3.5 uh, uh, megahertz up to I think it was uh, 7.5 uh, megahertz. That's the that's the scan there. So 80 meters to 40 meters. And one of the things it does is you can take your mouse and move the marker to the, the, the lowest spot on the SWR, and it will actually give you this readout here. So what that's saying is that at that point, it's 3.58 megahertz. The SWR is, uh, as a matter of fact, here, I've got all the, that information there. The SWR is about 1.1 to 1, pretty good. And uh, and it's and it's uh, uh, slightly capacitive, but only uh, only a little bit by uh, uh, 70 picofarads. Uh, and um, and the, and so basically, the the point that I am am looking at here is probably that point on the on the Smith chart. And in fact, I could actually move my pointer on the Smith chart to that location and actually get a readout on what what it's, it's reading there. Um, so next antenna. OK, looks a little bit different. OK, this one is most resonant at 7.1 megahertz. 
no longer down at the, down around 3.5. Uh, and uh, and it, it gets it tends to be a little bit inductive. We've got a, a, a plus on the imaginary portion. Please don't don't get hung up on on what those are. Those of you who want to dive into the uh, into the extra exam, uh, you'll you'll see a lot of J's. Uh, but anyway, it's basically it's it's off by about five micro Henrys. A little bit slightly inductive. Uh, and it's got a pretty good SWR of, uh, of 1.2. Not, not as good as the last one, but OK there. OK, the, the next one. OK, this one's also sort of good at 80 meters. But remember, the other one sort of, sort of curved up slowly. This one's really, really tuned in. It, it doesn't, if you change the frequency just a little bit, the characteristics of the antenna are going to change a lot. So this one has its sweet spot at 366. And uh, the impedance is, uh, is uh, relatively low, OK? Notice there's no part on the Smith chart that gets actually to that, that uh, 50 ohm, that middle part that we'd like to see. Uh, now, one of the things about this is that it takes and breaks this chunk of frequency up into about 100 little chunks. It doesn't actually do continuous measurements. It only measures each one one hundredth of the, the thing. So where we see the darker dots on the display here are where it really took points. And the truth be told, this is when points are far apart, that means that it's changing dramatically over short distances, which of course it is. It's, you know, the distance between points, the SWR is, is, is dropping like crazy just by moving a little bit. And I'm guessing that what's happened here is that actually this antenna probably has a point that's out here <laughs> that's closer to 50 ohms that isn't showing up because it's in one of those gaps between the 100 points. So it would be better to go back and actually change my starting and, and ending uh, stimulus to make something that was maybe just sweeping only the 80 meter band. And then I'd get more detail and I'd probably get a little, little more accurate result there. Uh, the, um, okay, and, uh, and what about this one? This one's got two, sweet, two good spots here. Because see our, our curves, We've got got two curves that all get sort of close to that uh, that uh, uh, good spot on our Smith chart, and so this one is resonant both at three point about three point seven, and also at about seven point one four, and with comparable SWRs of about uh, about uh, one point three roughly, or one to one point three. Okay, so though, so that uh, that one does well on both. So, which antenna was which? Okay, the the uh, forty meter antenna, eighty meter antenna with tuner, eighty meter antenna without specific tuner, and antenna with both a forty meter dipole and an and an eighty meter dipole. Well, let's let's look at them here. Okay. Well, that one that was the 80 meter dipole was uh, was the K4D and D uh, dedicated dipole, and that's one that that has sort of a relatively smooth curve up from that uh, that best spot. Uh, the dedicated 40 meter dipole, well, that was the one that was resonant at 40 meters. That was that was sort of an easy one. And then uh, the uh, uh, Joe's antenna with the with the tuner on it there, that tuner makes it so that it's it's very specific. You can get a really good a tune really well to to a frequency, but don't plan on scanning up and down the band with that uh, with that particular an antenna. And then finally, we've got that Warren's antenna that had both the 40 and the 80 meter dipole. And guess what? It worked both on 40 and 80 meters. Uh, you know, we've got a got a got a good spot there on that. The um, now the uh, there's also 
a ton of other things you can do with the nano DNA. One of the things that I think is sort of neat is the software will also present, will tell you how long it thinks your cable is, which is handy because if you happen to have a break halfway down your cable and you don't know exactly where it is, anything that will give you an estimate on it is, is valuable. So that's what's referred to as TDR, or time to domain reflectometry. Uh, you can also, like I say, by using that second connector, you can do all sorts of things in terms of examining the, the, the actual values of components. I always use my voltmeter to check out resistors because I'm colorblind and I can't use the color code to save my life. But this also allows you to do things to check the values of capacitors and, and things like that. Um, and uh, they're not like I say, terribly, terribly, uh, terribly expensive. There are lots of uh, YouTubes out there on on how to do this. There's there's a if you need to to figure out how to do lots of really complex things with it, there are YouTubes that that will show you how to do it. These were a couple that I particularly used. And then uh, that that's it for, for for questions. John, how would you compare it to something like? a handheld antenna analyzer like the one Bob Romanko and I bought. Right. One of the things that uh, that we actually did during the test was that we actually uh, uh, hooked up to uh, uh, N4PGS, Greg's antenna. We actually hooked up both his antenna analyzer and Joe's antenna analyzer and the nano DNA. Uh, and uh, it came out to be, let's see, uh, yeah, they basically, they, they were very comparable. We said the nano VNA said it was here. I'll, I'll share the screen again. Um, yeah, the, the nano VNA said it was uh, 1.24 uh, to one. Their antenna analyzer said it was 1.3. And that, and that they gave it at a slightly different, uh, different frequency. They were testing at, uh, at, at 7.2, and this was saying 7.1. But it actually came out surprisingly well. Now, I will say also that when I first started off doing it, I had screwed up something on the calibration, and it was giving unbelievable numbers. I mean, I had like SWRs of one to like millions. <laughs> So when I finally went through and got the calibrations correct, then it then it performed well. So I I was actually very pleased with the with the results there. Uh, but I, but I would be open to, to to doing sort of sort of more testing on it. Years ago, there was a commercial antenna. It was a eighty through ten meter dipole made by a company called Morgan. And they guaranteed low SWR, and it turns out they actually had a 50 ohm resistor at somewhere near the feed point. So <laughs> they give you a relatively low SWR, but it wasn't a very good radiator. Yeah. And by the way, I'm, uh, when I stop sharing the screen, your pictures do show up, so you will be part of the recording. So blank yourself if you want to book out. <laughs> the uh, hey, uh, Steve, go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering. Can I use the, the nano VO, uh, VNA as like an SWR meter so that I can tell how much might be coming backwards off the antenna? Uh, the the, the answer is that you can, but not when you're using your transmitter. Because the nano VNA has its own built-in transmitter. And, and if you try to route the sort of power that's going out to your antenna, mm -hmm you are going to have one cooked VNA <laughs> okay. in very short order. So there's definitely a place for SWR meters for actually monitoring your real time transmission on the frequency that you're transmitting. If you want to figure out which frequencies your antenna is good on, yeah. then the nano VNA is, is better. And by the way, we've got tons of folks on here that know more about VNAs and test equipment that I even, I will know in my entire lifetime. So please, please feel free to jump in if I got something horribly, horribly wrong. Now, I was very happy to get this when I, when I first got the radio and stuff and absolutely no instructions whatsoever on this. 
And like, well, this is, you know, it took a long time just to be able to, you know, to be able to get the SWR on it through YouTube and things like that. <laughs> yeah, so you, YouTube, YouTube's got some, got some good stuff out there. And mm -hmm. like I say, as long as you sort of, if you can find either the, the format or the trace menu, it lets you tune it down to something that's a little more manageable. That first screen is frightful. So in other words, these are good for building, calibrating, adjusting antennas. But once you have your antenna configuration set up, yeah. use an in shack SWR meter. John, do you want to elaborate a little bit on my note that we're really not quite measuring SWR by the purest sense of the word? Yeah, well, uh, the thing is that I think that it's well, the, yeah, the, the uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I may let you sort of, uh, sort, of okay. uh, sort of talk about that. One of the things is that it's you, you, it's doing VSWR, which is based on the voltages uh, that it's seeing. It's basically what voltage goes out and what voltage comes back. But uh, uh, but go ahead, Ed. Uh, uh, yeah, well, you know, basically SWR. It's a fairly complicated formula. It's like one plus row over one minus row. And these are reflection coefficients, but it's measured at the antenna. So to really reduce your SWR, you actually have to change your antenna lengthen or shorten it or have an antenna right at the feed point. Well, it's much easier to measure the SWR inside our shacks so when we're using meters such as the nanometer or my rig expert or the SWR meter built into my station monitor, it's measuring input impedance because there's characteristics of the coax. So we tend to slightly underestimate the SWR, but it's still important. So for example, years ago as a new ham, I would cut trim my coax to lower the SWR. Well, you can't lower your SWR by trimming your coax. That's the inherent mismatch between the coax impedance and the complex impedance of the feed point. But the reason it appeared to lower the SWR, it was changing the input impedance to a value more acceptable to the rig. So inside, technically, we're measuring apparent SWR. Yeah. But for the purposes of building and testing antennas, it, it's accurate enough. Now, I want to share a story about three years ago. I noticed over about a one-year period, my SWR on 20 meters was going down across the band. Immediately, I knew that meant my coax was deteriorating. It had become very lossy because it meant that the reflected signal was being attenuated by the lossy coax. So the meter was underestimating what the real SWR was. So meters are, like I said, if your SWR goes down dramatically, it often means your coax is deteriorated. And UV light will definitely deteriorate coax over about a, a 10 to 15 year period. The, uh, yeah, now one of the things is that because this is small and portable in principle, if you want to climb up and uh, on a big ladder and attach this directly to the antenna without the feed line in the way, <laughs> you might be able to get your real antenna SWR. Right. <laughs> but but I, I, climbing up 40 feet in the air in order to do that could be, could be a little tricky. The... Um, uh, but uh, but yeah, th thanks for that because I that, like I say I'm, I'm I consider myself a, a newbie with respect to a lot of the people here and and experience with SWR. But of course the the critical thing also is you need to have you ideally what you want to have is everything in your antenna uh, feed line and and antenna you'd like to have them all have the same SWR because it's a little bit like uh, you know if you take a light beam and you're going from air that has one density and you hit water, well, you get stuff that reflects off the surface of the water. It's the same thing sort of with the radio waves. If you have something that's the same sort of a density throughout, then it just goes straight through and you don't get parts, parts ricocheting back. And that's what the reason that you like to have everything matched up. And the rig expects 50 ohms, so that's what you, what you like, to, like to give it. 
John, you perhaps an adjunct follow on topic, maybe for the September meeting, could be something ex very practical like waterproofing connectors, because I field about one question a week from a member like, well, it rained and my SWR changed to 10 to 1. That's well, it's, it's, you know, it's water in the connectors. Well, if somebody would like to give us a, I have my ways of doing connectors. And I think maybe that what we could do for the September meeting would be a panel discussion where each person shows how they terminate their connectors. Your and method they, works well. Yep. Yep. All, yeah. Well, there's, there's more than one way to do it. But first of all, there, are there any questions from anybody else out there or any comments from anybody that has sort of more, more expertise? W4NUA, I'd never heard of the nanometer until a few months ago. Then the guys started talking about them up here, and I said, my gosh, why don't we start? And I went to electronic school, and for, but that was back in the 50s. And nothing like that back then. But it's really an amazing piece of equipment. I'm thinking about buying one, and even at my age, I mean, it's being hard to see and everything, just to play with, to yeah. learn, you know. If you got 50 bucks burning a hole in your pocket, you can do it. But like I say, try to get one that has the little calibration kit. That's uh, $66 or something. Yeah. John, was yours a kit or pre-assembled? No, mine, mine, mine came, uh, no, well, mine is not a kit. And yes, they do, do sell them as kits. Mine just came with that stuff and then i added the little uh the, the bnc connectors and the adapters you will need adapters to go from the uh, uh the sma connector the little tiny connector into something that you can actually hook to your antenna so you do need to do need to get an adapter as well and it does come with some little little tiny cables here that you know may or may not last very long to allow me to sort of do that uh, that conversion. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, well, it, I was, I was very pleased with it. Well, John, thank you very much. Oh, Ben has a question for you. Actually, just a quick comment uh, towards uh, uh, Frank's concern about the, the screen. As, as John showed you, you can also hook it up by USB and have it up on your computer screen. And I find that to be a lot more helpful because that screen, it is pretty small, but once it's hooked to your computer, you can actually see a lot more. And I really, I think you can do a lot more with it. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree, but I do find that it's nice because there's sometimes when I'm out in the, you know, where I really don't want to carry a computer out in the middle of the field to do, do something. And, uh, and it is nice for that. Um, anyway, uh, I will uh, stop the recording here and uh